Welcome friends, James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com. Today is the 19th of January, 2015, and today we are joined on the line once again by Dr. Tim Ball of drtimball.com. Of course, a regular guest here on the program and someone who uh, taught at the University of Winnipeg for 24 years before retiring to the lovely west coast of Canada, my home and native land. He is, of course, once again at drtimball.com, which will be linked up in the show notes. And we are going to be picking up from last month's conversation, where we left off just before getting into the meat and potatoes of a very interesting conversation on geography and politics. But before we get into that, Dr. Tim Ball, for anyone who's even been keeping a cursory eye on the headlines this week, they will have seen it's January, so it's time to announce that last year, once again, was the hottest year ever. More definitive proof of global warming in general and man-made global warming in in particular according to the headline writers at any rate uh this is just such a ridiculous claim that comes up every year like clockwork so i think we should at least take a moment to acknowledge this claim and uh to debunk some of the the ridiculous uh, uh type of patter that gets uh, propounded by people who hasn't haven't actually looked at how this number is arrived at let alone how it's processed well it, it, exactly and and um it, it's so ridiculous that uh, they uh, started announcing it in October before the year had even finished, <laughs> and and they were actually working on it. But I I've been monitoring the headlines because um, I knew that they were going to do this because they are really up against the wall politically. The the conference in per, in Lima, Peru that we talked about, uh, which was really an absolute bust. But it was, and they ended up with some sort of very milk toast uh, statement. But it it was designed to prepare for the next big conference in Berlin, and uh, so they're, they're really up against it. The public um, are really starting to ask questions uh, about what's going on. Uh, they also uh, the polls that are coming out, one devastating one, James, that were the United Nations itself polled six million people, and they listed uh, the public concern about uh, climate change and global warming as the very last concern, like 38 out of 38. And so um, they've got to keep the political pressure on. So so this uh, jiggling of the books has been a standard uh, practice from, from the time that they first uh, began. And by that I mean back in 1990, where they they set out the claim that because of human CO2, the global temperatures would increase and we would end up with runaway global warming. By doing that, uh, they put themselves on a treadmill because it meant that any time any evidence came out that contradicted what they were, were claiming, they had to either fiddle the books as they've done or uh, come up with some lame excuse that would uh, would bypass it. So that's been the whole history of this use of climate change for a political agenda. And and of course this this year 2014 is another example. The two agencies that are directly responsible for this uh, have been the most um vocal uh, especially since the Climatic Research Unit at the East Anglia was exposed with the leaked emails. So NASA gifts, and, and NASA has got to be embarrassed. I mean, for example, 26 former astronauts, astronauts after they retired came out and said, the science that NASA's pushing is completely wrong, yet they continue to do it. And, and the reason is, of course, because... James Hansen, who was handpicked by Gore and uh, Senator Timothy Wirth to appear before their committee in 1988 and say that human uh, that the world was warming up and it was due to human uh, production of CO2, that was the treadmill that they got on, um, and they they picked uh, Hansen out, brought him in, and and this gives you an idea of how corrupt this whole thing is, James, because. Um, they went to the, they found out about Hansen and they went to him and said, "Would you appear?" And he said, "Yeah." And he said what he'd say. Then they looked at the weather record and said, "What's the warmest day on average in Washington?" That's the day they arranged to have the hearing with Hansen appearing. And then the night before, they went into the hearing room, opened all the windows, and shut off the air conditioning. 
And all of this is documented. Senator Worth, as he was then, and he's now at the UN, is very proud of this. He, he talks about it on a, a, a public broadcasting uh, frontline website about how they did this. And of course, the, there was this hearing saying, "Oh, yeah, it's, it's getting, it's, the world's getting warmer, and everybody in the room is sweating away." I mean, it, it, it's uh, political stagecraft that uh, beggars description. But Hansen was the head of NASA, then went on to become the head of NASA GIS, which is the Goddard Institute of Space Studies. And they're the ones that um, uh, pushed this 2014 uh, being the warmest on record. And, and the Hansen, funny part about that is yeah, that Hansen, sorry. in fact, in 2011, when they came out with the annual hottest year ever claim for 2010, Hansen specifically said that it isn't particularly important what the what individual year is the hottest year ever. It's the, ter- the trend that's important because yeah. he had to admit that there are different temperature data sets that they get this from. There's GIST, there's NC. DC, there's the Met Office, and they often conflict. This is not a this is not like a reading a thermometer that that there's some global temperature average that they're getting here. These are jiggered numbers. Well, exactly, and and that's of course uh, been their problem, and and most people don't understand that. They think there's only one official number out there, and of course the NASA gets people have worked on making that the case, and NOAA's been involved in it as well. Um, and, but. Uh, what people have to realize is that if you see a temperature average for the Earth that is anything other than 0. 0.00 or 0. 0.5, it is a statistic because um, the historic temperature record was only measured to a half a degree. So even though in the modern era, with what they call thermocouples, they can measure to thousandths of a degree, they can't use that precise measurement because it doesn't fit with the historic record. So when you see them saying, oh, it was 0.029 the warmest year, it's it's purely been uh, statistically manipulated. That's exactly and, uh, right. And and we yeah. are talking about hundredths of a degree difference between the hottest and the next hottest year. So really, I mean, that's yeah. smaller than the error bars for these figures, uh, even if we oh, did. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the, from the very start, as I said, they, they were uh, manipulating the data. Some of the things they've done is uh, they, I mean, the World Meteorological Organization, organizing all of the weather offices around the world to do this. And that's why Murray Strong set up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change through the World Meteorological Organization, because it gave him control over the bureaucrats and the data sets and everything else. Uh, But uh, what what they've been doing over the last, well, prior to 2000, now there's a reason for that, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but what they've done is they've said, oh, well, the historic record is poorly measured, and therefore we've got to adjust it. Every adjustment they've made has been to lower the previous, the early record, which, of course, what that does is it makes the slope of the curve look steeper. So it says, oh, the warming is more dramatic than we thought. It isn't. It's because they've deliberately adjusted the record. And they've adjusted every single record in the world, every one. In fact, there was a charge against the New Zealand uh, government uh, agency that keeps the temperature, uh, you know, saying that this had been done deliberately. And and so, but of course, they've had to do this to maintain this claim that the current temperatures are the warmest ever. Now, I've just written an article to put this all in perspective. Um, in When the headline of it says that 2014 was one of the 3% of the coldest years in 10,000 years. Now, when you take the temperature record from the Greenland ice cores, 97% of those readings are warmer than 2014. And yet, uh, of course, uh, what the what the uh, official NASA guess wants you to believe is, oh, 2014 is the warmest ever. They're not saying that. The public are hearing that. What NASA guess are saying it's the warmest in the record, but they don't then tell you, oh, well, the record's only a hundred years. But when you put the temperature of 2014 in the 10,000 year record, 
it suddenly, as I said, uh, amongst the 3% of the coldest years. So this is all part of, of the politicizing of global warming to convince people that human CO2 is the cause. Now, the reason I mentioned the year 2000 earlier was that was a pivotal year in that um, satellites were launched. Now, they'd been launched earlier, but um, they to get them adjusted to determine uh, temperature from space, um, the University of Alberta at Huntsville finally uh, got it all organized, and now we have two uh, data sets of temperature for the whole globe. One is called the RSS, and the other is the UAH, the um, uh, Alabama one. Now, uh, what's significant about this is that these satellites measure temperature around the entire globe. The NASA GIS record and the HADCRUT record, that's the Hadley Center um, uh, and the Climatic Research Unit uh, Center, Hadley Center is the uh, UK weather office, uh, those are simply from surface stations, uh, the, what, what people are familiar with, the white box with the, um, uh, with the slats on it, the Stevenson screen. Now, 70, we, about 85% of the world, there is no surface temperature data. Virtually all of it is on land. The 70% of oceans, there's virtually no data. The 19% of land that's mountains, there's virtually no data. The 19% of the land surface that's deserts, there's virtually no data. The, the Amazon rainforest, there's virtually no data. The boreal forest, there's virtually no data. Virtually all of the weather stations we've got are concentrated in eastern, uh, the eastern U.S. and western Europe. And so what they're giving you is a temperature measurement from a, a very, very limited number of stations that are really concentrated in just two parts of the world. And when you look at uh, and what they've also done to um, further exaggerate the warming is that in, in 1960, they, they said, oh, well, the satellite's going to go up, and it's gonna, uh, we won't need the surface stations anymore. So they started closing the, weather, the surface stations. And then in 1990, they closed even more, or not closed stations, they, they reduced the number of stations that they were using to determine the global average temperature. So, for example, in the whole of Arctic Canada, in an area that is um, the, almost the size of the continental United States and, and a very pivotal area because of the cold, they only have one weather station called Eureka. And I'm very familiar with Eureka and know that it's an anomalously warm weather station in the whole of the Arctic uh, region. But this is the kind of thing that they've been doing. And there's a very, very telling plot of as the number of weather stations declined, the global temperature went up. And, and you can see that particularly starting in, in the 1990s and then into the year 2000. So every single thing they've done has served to make the present temperatures seem higher than they actually are. And, of course, that's because that's the message that they've been pushing all along. And so the, the year 2014 is the warmest fits into that. Just one last, uh, one other thing, James, uh, uh, last thing, there's so much to talk about with this. But, uh, yeah, they're now, we're now hearing that the, it was 0 0.029 warmer than, uh, the, than the other records. And that, it was only warmer, or sorry, the error in that was 0.09. In other words, there was a 38% error in the, in the uh, difference. Now, that's not new because the listeners will be familiar, and I know you're very familiar, with something called the hockey stick. And this is Sorry, just to clarify, you they... say 38% error, yeah. but you mean 62% error, right? They're 38% certain, they're 62% uncertain. Yes, exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and, and, and of course, that, that they came out now... Uh, uh, Gavin Schmidt came out with that information a couple of days after he'd had all of the press briefings about it being the warmest on record. But, of course, he knows that it's the first headline that you get out there that counts. The, the follow-ups are never picked up by the mainstream media. But in the hockey stick, 
they not only uh, the, their problem was that uh, people like me and Richard Lindzen and a few others were saying, look, it isn't warmer today than ever. It, it was warmer a thousand years ago in the medieval warm period, and we've talked about this on this program. Well, what they did was they literally rewrote history. They got rid of the medieval warm period. And, and uh, so they showed that uh, a graph where the handle of the hockey stick showed virtually no temperature change for almost a thousand years. And then suddenly in the 20th century, there was this dramatic upturn of temperature, which was really the blade of the hockey stick. Now, they achieved that with corruption because the, the blade of, or the handle of the hockey stick was done with tree rings. But tree rings are not about temperature. They're about precipitation. But they, they, they ignored that, knowing the public didn't know that. And then, starting in 1900, the, 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 even though they were using tree ring data, it was showing the temp, or the, what they were claiming was the temperature, it showed it declining. Well, they couldn't have that. So what they did was they programmed the computer and they said, look, if the temperature goes down, plug in the modern temperature record. In other words, you're grafting instrumental records onto a, 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 a tree ring record, which is scientifically incorrect and wrong to do, but that's what they did. And that, of course, then um, the, the computer was actually, the code told it, hide the decline. That became the catchword, and that's how they did it. So the tree ring data that that they were using was showing the temperature continued to go down into the 20th century. They couldn't allow that, so they, they stopped the tree ring data and plugged in the modern instrumental record. Now, where did the model, modern instrumental record come from? Well, that was created by Phil Jones, who was the director of the Climatic Research Unit, where we got the leaked emails and all the corruption that they did. And Jones claimed that he had reconstructed temperatures from the 1880s up to uh, the 1990s and that it showed a 0.6 degree Celsius uh, warming, or, sorry, yeah, 0.6 degree Celsius warming in about 120 years. Now, he claimed, he then claimed, oh, that's a greater increase in temperature than could occur naturally. That's simply false, but that was the story he put out there. And then what he, it was, it was in, it published, but again, nobody paid any attention to it other than a few people like myself. It was 0. 0.6 degrees plus or minus 0. 0.2. So it was a, a 76% uh, error range. And, and so, uh, this idea of these error ranges uh, making the actual data meaningless has been going on from the very start. And it was done with the hockey stick blade, and now it's been done with the 2014 record. But, of course, as I said, um, they, they, they know that they've got to get the headline out there. Once the headline's out there, that, that's what the public remember, and that's what the mainstream media pick upon. And, and, and it's really... Uh, Quite bluntly, it, it, it's criminal. It's absolutely criminal because they know what they're doing. They're very aware of what they're doing. Unfortunately so. And as you say, there are so many different aspects of this to debunk. I'm sure we could spend even more time on the nuance and the detail. But it's one of those situations where I think the more the, the less you know about how this, this number is arrived at, the more you tend to just believe the headlines. And uh, the more you look into it, the more you realize it really is a politically constructed uh, tale that's being uh, put out there. And and as you say, even, even the people who were involved in this, the Hansons and the Gavin Schmitz and others, downplay or admit the, uh, the, the range of error that, that's in these numbers, but only after the headlines have had their political effect. So I think we understand what direction this is tending in. But but let's let's switch now to that political yeah. aspect of it, because in in uh, in some of the, the the preparatory emails that we exchanged in preparation for this conversation, you talked about how you wanted to to um, to get into the the story of how geography and history could connect geopolitics in its most real literal meaning, geography and politics. And you did mention the uh, yeah. the intriguing phrase that if if, uh, if geography is the stage, then history is the play. I think that's an extremely interesting way of looking at it and helps to put into perspective just how geography dependent our historical and political reality has been. Perhaps you can talk about um, just how, how you started to come to this realization of the connection and, and how, that, uh, how that developed in your thinking. 
Well, it, it started with uh, a, a much broader uh, concern about what was going on and, and studying the world. It, it really began with me when I, when I looked at the fact that they had identified Alexander von Humboldt, who was a German scientist, who was, de- was described as the last universal person. And what they meant by that was that he knew all of the science that was to be known at that time. He knew all the chemistry, the biology, the physics. He had been to every continent. And in fact, uh, because of his wider view and understanding, he was responsible for some very fundamental things that we take for granted today. For example, he was the first to start drawing weather maps based upon the pressure patterns and the wind patterns. And, and so that idea of a universal person intrigued me because uh, one of the problems we have in today's world and the reason that they've been able to get away with this um, uh, corruption uh, with the climate issue is that you've got everybody's a specialist. In other words, everybody's got one piece of an enormously complex puzzle, but we're not even looking at the box stop. We've, we haven't got the box stop even. And when you, when you apply it to climate, for example, the, how you do a puzzle is you find the four corner pieces. Well, we haven't even got the four corner pieces of the climate puzzle properly defined. And those would be uh, the, the geology, the oceanography, the atmosphere, and and the uh, and space and we haven't even got those things properly defined then you find the edge pieces and still most of those are missing so this this whole idea intrigued me and um of course it it uh after von humboldt and by the way what's also interesting to me is that he died in 1859 which was the same year that darwin's origin of species was published and of course with darwin where you've got uh, people starting to, to measure. You've got the, the, the Linnaean cl- classification system. People are out there trying to determine how many plants and animal species there are. And, and of course, the uh, proliferation of data and information uh, just became overwhelming. And um, so that it is, vir- it is virtually impossible uh, for any one person to even know one uh, the whole of, of one particular area of specialization. The analogy that I, I li- and I think this is a great deal of, of the problem, the analogy I like to use in medicine that people can relate to is that you've got the patient lying on, on the bed and the, the, the podiatrist is looking at the feet and the nephrologist looking at the kidneys and the neurosurgeon looking at the brain and the nurse who's concerned for the welfare of the whole patient is in the corner saying, but doctors, the patient's dead. <laughs> and, and so that, that's the difficulty that we've got in this incredibly complex world. And, um, and so that's really got what, what got me interested. Now, once I started studying climate and environmental issues, I was interested in uh, not just uh, how the climate changed, but the impact of climate change on the human condition. And... Um, I remember there was a book by a a fellow by the name of Claiborne, Roger Claiborne, and um, he wanted to do a doctoral thesis because he noticed that what the anthropologists were saying about human evolution didn't fit with what the geologists and the biologists were saying um, and the climatologists were saying about the weather patterns and the, the geologic changes and the biologic changes. And, and he said, they, they just don't fit together. And, and um, so he wanted to do a doctoral thesis on this. Um, the university turned him down and said, no, this is too general. No, you, you, you've got to come up with what, some small, very spe- special uh, thing, you know, one little area that you've got to look at. And so he just quit his doctoral thesis and went and wrote a book called uh, uh, is it Man, Climate, and History is the title of the book, where he tried to show that, you know, you couldn't have had this going on, say, in, in uh, Europe because it was covered with ice sheets at the time. What the, what the anthropologists are saying it couldn't have occurred because the ice sheets were there. And, and that really intrigued me, that this idea of uh, taking... Uh, events and seeing how they link together 
and it's only in putting the, the putting those links together that it makes any sense. And um, so that that really uh, the Claiborne book uh, really got me going. Now, I was very lucky, uh, James, in that I didn't go through education the way the system is set up to educate people, which doesn't fit how the human brain evolves and develops. Education today is designed basically to produce little work units for the Industrial Revolution. Aristotle very understood that very well. Aristotle said you should go to school uh, till you're about 12 years old, and in that first seven years of schooling, you learn basically all you need to know. And I am always reminded of that lovely poster that says, I, I learned everything I needed in life in kindergarten. Right. And, and um, that Aristotle said they should then take you out of school because all they can teach you after the age of 12 are things that require life experience to really appreciate. I mean, talking 100 years of history to a 13-year-old, is, you know, to whom a, a month is forever, is so incongruous and, and meaningless that no wonder they're bored silly. And Aristotle also pointed out that there are two distinctly different types of uh, uh, intellectual ability. He pointed out that you can have a math genius of five years old because math is an innate skill, and but you cannot have a philosophical genius of five years old because philosophy requires a much broader understanding of humanity and nature and life. And yet, of course, we completely confuse those things in our education system. So what I set out to do after flying for nine years in the, in the Canadian Air Force, chasing Russian submarines around the North Atlantic, but more particularly five years of search and rescue in the Canadian Arctic, and learning a great deal about weather and climate because of flying in, in those conditions, and I lost my flying category through a hearing loss, so I decided that I didn't want to continue in the Air Force, so I went back to university at the age of 29. That's when you should go to university, when you've got some life experience and you can put into context what they're trying to teach you. But the school system doesn't allow that. And, and uh, so, of course, um, you, you've got the absolute uh, farcical situation that we've got going on in today's world, where for most of the students that are in university, it's simply a socially acceptable form of unemployment. <laughs> and, but, but, but it also led me, James, to, um, as I said, to, to organize my, post my graduate degrees. Now, most students go in and they, they well, I can't tell you how many students when I was a prof would come in to talk to me and say, well, I've been in the university four years and I don't know where to go from here. And I said, let me guess. You took first year psychology. You got a B plus. The professor said you should take a degree in a major in, bio, in, in psychology. And now you're four years into an honor psychology degree and you don't know why you're there and where you're going from here. Oh, yeah, how did you know that? <laughs> because I've, I've seen students wandering around absolutely lost. Uh, you know, they get into psychology because they think they're going to learn about themselves, and then they find out that it's just a load of, of bunkum. And, and uh, anyway, back to my original point. I set out to do an honors – well, one of the things that uh, – this is a bizarre story in a way, but I was taking a course in soils – and there was a formula given out for the formation of soils, and it said soils equals um, parent material, which of course was the rock, weathering, which is the uh, freeze and thaw and water acting on it, uh, organic action, and chemical action. Now, chemical action, okay, you could see the, the um, you know, dissolving of, of chemicals and carbonic acid, which is rain, 10% and that. But the organic thing, it only listed roots of plants and burrowing insects. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, well, hang on a minute. Aren't humans a major source of, of soil creation? Aren't we part of, we're plowing, we're, we're changing the soil, we're removing the forest? Why aren't humans listed in that organic 
component of the soil formation. Well, I started digging into it. And it happened to be, and this was 1968, there was a very, very important conference. Now, I say it was important because it was a pivotal point, but like with most pivotal points, people don't realize at the time. But there was a professor at the University of Chicago who was asking some of the same questions. He organized a conference out of which came a book, and the book was titled Man's Role in Changing the Environment. Now, in 1968, that was an absolutely a, a, you know, major idea, and, and it just absolutely grasped, uh, grabbed me. And some of the chapters in that book, for example, there was a guy from Cambridge University who reconstructed the extent of forests in England in, at the time of the Doomsday Book in 1089. And then he plotted the change in forests up to the present day. And, and of course, you see the dramatic changes that that makes to the landscape as the forest is changed and, and so on. Uh, well, this, this really, really uh, intrigued me. But I want to discover first, why hadn't academics looked at humans as a cause of change? What was it about them what, that, that the academic world wouldn't accept? So I, I ended up doing an honors thesis, which was titled, Some Philosophical Considerations of Humans as a Geomorphic Agent. Now, geomorphology, of course, is the shape of the landscape. And um, I got, it got me into looking at uh, the, the geography of, of changing landscapes. And um, I realized that one of the things that German geography had identified was that there were two distinct landscapes. There was the, the, uh, what they called the, the Landschaft, which was the natural landscape. And then there was the Kulturschaft, which was the cultural landscape. And, of course, you go to Europe, you can see the natural landscape because on a larger scale, the mountains and the rivers are essentially uh, not going to be changed that much by humans, although a lot of river diversions and so on have gone on. But the, the cultural landscape has been going on for thousands of years to the point where um, the, the finer features of the, of the natural landscape are simply not visible anymore. And, and so um, this, this, as I said, really, really intrigued me. Now, it particularly intrigued me because li living in Canada, uh, I knew that 99.9% the .9 of Canada, there was virtually no evidence of humans at all. There was no impact or imprint of humans on, on the physical landscape. And, and so that got me uh, into this, uh, as I said, my honors thesis on considering humans as an agent of change. Now, I knew then that in order to study this, I had to understand um, both geography, the landscape, and then history, how humans ha had changed over time, their ability to implement change on that landscape. But I also need, knew I needed to understand science, because science would give you the physical measurements of that change, change in soil chemistries, change in energy inputs, and so on. So I didn't want a, a, a science degree per se. I didn't want a physics degree, for example. But I wanted to understand the scientific method, how science worked, so I did a master's thesis, which was a very specific study of the energies involved in the deposition of sediments on a sand and on a beach. So on a beach, of course, you've got the wave action affecting and sorting the sand sediments, and then you've got the wind blowing the finer particles away and depositing them as a berm at the back of the beach. And, and, of course, then you've got uh, also places where the, the rainfall is, is affecting and r r streams running across the beach. So what I was really interested in was the energy inputs that created the physical changes in the, in the landscape. And, uh, and so it involved, uh, you know, 
scientific method, collecting samples and, and running uh, uh, t lab tests and then doing statistical analysis of the results and so on. But then I wanted to combine those two things together. Uh, and so in my doctoral thesis, I'm now confronted with a thing that has inhibited our understanding of the world, and that is the differences between the um, uh, between an arts degree and a science degree. Now, this, um, of course, if you go to any university virtually today, maybe some like the MIT might be slightly different, but what you find is that 80% of the students will avoid lab courses, are hate numbers, are terrified of math, and 20% are comfortable in lab courses and comfortable with science. Now, that, that's generally true of the population at large. And so, of course, now flipping back to, to what we were talking about with the 2014 warmest year, 20, only 20% of the, the population are, are, are even going to um, be able to grasp what they're claiming about the statistics and the numbers, whereas the other 80% not only can't grasp it, but don't want to grasp it. They brag about not being able to, to work with numbers or to count things. They're proud of that. And so you have this problem in society, uh, and, and of course in the, in the 19th and the 20th century, science became increasingly dominant and increasingly important in dictating um, the way the world was headed. Um, it, of course, it was part of the battle that went on when science chose, uh, without asking him, but and, and he would have been very reluctant about it anyway, they chose Darwin as their scientific champion to defeat religion, because, of course, that's the other side of, of what was going on. And, and, and so what we have now is a society in which 80% of our, our art students, 20% are, are science students. And I became very familiar with that problem because I, for, for 24 years, or 25 years actually, I, saw, I taught a science credit for art students. Now the only way I could make it palatable to them, and it speaks to what we're talking about here, was that um, I, I subtitled the, the course, um, The Way the Earth Works. And, and, and I made it palatable to the students because I said, look, you are all students of Earth, whether you like it or not, or not students of Earth, but you're all citizens of Earth. And therefore, as citizens of Earth, you're going to have to make decisions about how that Earth works. And so you're not going to have, you need to have at least some grasp of what's going on. So I taught them the course in two separate sections. There was uh, half of it was on climate, and half of it was on geomorphology, the shape of uh, and the, the, the landscape. And, and of course, um, uh, I said you're going to have to make decisions about water resources, about climate, about environment. And if you if you don't uh, have even a, a, a sort of even a fundamental ideas of it, you're going to be taken advantage of. It's, and it, it's that old uh, comment that if, you, if the guy said, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. And it's so really, really true. And, and so um, in my doctoral thesis then, I wanted to combine the arts and the science. <clears throat> and, and, and because so much information is available that, is, that scientists don't use, and there's so much science that the arts people don't use or understand. And, and of course, climate uh, gave me the perfect vehicle to cross over those things. And um, uh, I, what I did was I took one of the longest, most detailed records of daily weather patterns, including instrumental temperature records anywhere in the world, and that was the record of the Hudson Bay Company. Now, the Hudson Bay Company um, were in the fur trade in Canada from 1670 onwards. Their records really become uh, very detailed, starting in 1712. And they kept daily journals in which the first entry in every daily journal was the weather for the day, and it was recorded in scientific format. 
a format that was set out for ship's logs as well by a Dr. James Duran in 1722. So here you had a well-regulated uh, and controlled daily weather uh, thing. What I did was I then created a computer code. So for all the different 32 points of the, of the compass for wind, I gave each a number. I could then quantify all of this data and then with, once I'd got the quantified data, I could run statistical analysis of it. And uh, it included an incredible variety of information, um, number of days of rain, number of days of snow, first day of rain, first day of snow, um, and on and on and on. Um, and, and I ended up with over 6 million digits of information uh, for about a 300-year period. Now, this is very important, James, because when Hubert Lamb, who I had the privilege, helped me with, uh, worked with him on my doctoral thesis, I went to visit him at Norfolk, he set up, he, he uh, created the Climatic Research Unit. And when he did it, he said the reason I did it was because until we've got re decent records, long-term records, of the changing climate over time, there's absolutely no way that we're going to be able to understand uh, or, or determine the mechanisms and the causes of those changes. And, and uh, so, of course, I know that um, uh, he'd be absolutely mortified by what happened at the Climatic Research Unit. He knew what was going on. He knew they were perverting it to the computer models. But by that time, he was in his 90s, and there was nothing he could do about it. But um, anyway, uh, my, my doctoral thesis then was uh, taking historical data and uh, turning it into quantified data that we could then run statistical analysis. Now, I had, an, I had another benefit with those Hudson Bay com Company records, and this is what's interesting about it. They, as a company, knew that their success depended on understanding the weather and the climate for two reasons. One is that, that the source of their food supply was cat, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, harvesting animals and, and living off the land, okay? The, the other was that the fur trade, the number of furs and so on, were uh, determined by, um, uh, by the changing weather conditions. And, and so they sent, uh, they worked with the Royal Society in England, they brought thermometers and barometers to Churchill, Manitoba, uh, as early as 1768. So I had this long record. Now, as I studied the Hudson Bay Company and how it functioned as a multi, the first multinational corporation in the history of the world, it essentially operated as an independent nation. It had literally had the rule of life and death over its employees. It controlled one twelfth of the world's land surface at its peak. And from that, I started to understand that this control of land, the control of territory, the control of boundaries was uh, absolutely uh, essential to understanding what was going on. And, and uh, so uh, from that, those two things, I started to teach other courses at the university. Now, one of the early ones I did was I realized very, very quickly that droughts were the single biggest problem for flora and fauna and therefore humans. And by the way, that's, that's what's interesting about this, uh, what the, they're doing at the United Nations. The focus is on temperature, but in the short and medium term, the really critical thing is what's happening to the precipitation patterns. I realized drought was critical, so I started teaching a course in water resources. And, and that, of course, is the most fundamental of resources. The world has been, there have been wars fought over water. There will continue to be wars fought over water. And I think it's, it's going to be the resource issue of the 21st century. Now, um, out of all of that, I started to realize that nations and nation states developed around controlling land and controlling the resources in that land. And so, um, a former colleague had, uh, He'd been teaching a course in, in geography and, uh, and politics, and um, he, he didn't want to teach it anymore. So 
I said, I'd love to take it over. And, I, and the, the department agreed on that. And I said, well, I want to call it geopolitics. They wouldn't let me. Now, the reason for that, of course, it, is that these were people that uh, were educated, got their degrees post-war. And the word geopolitics came out of German geography. And geopolitics was... Uh, seen as the brutal control of land and people as practiced by Nazi Germany. And therefore, uh, e even in the 60s and 70s, they wouldn't allow me to teach or use the word geopolitics. And I remember uh, taking the dean of uh, geography from, or the head of the geography department from Durham University in England, and I drove him around Winnipeg, uh, because I was the, one of the students that had a car, and the department asked me if I'd do it. I'm driving around, and we drive by a lawn bowling uh, facility. And he said, oh, I'm surprised to see that in Winnipeg. And I said, well, uh, why are, you know, are you surprised? Because there's a, there's a large English group living here in Winnipeg. And he said, oh, well, I didn't think the climate would allow it. And I said to him, oh, well, climatic determinism, eh? He went berserk. I mean, he really started <laughs> shouting at me. And, and, and he said, don't mention that filthy term to me. Well, this was a term, climatic determinism, that also environmental determinism came out of it, was one of the underlying themes of um, German geography in the 1860s and 1870s. A German geographer by the name of Friedrich Ratzel wrote a po book called uh, Anthropogeography. And of course, what it was, was how human behavior and patterns of behavior are affected by, uh, by the landscape. And uh, what was added into this was that uh, the Darwinian idea, so all of these things sort of feed together and mix together, um, was the Darwinian idea that a nation is a cellular structure, just like any other organism, a nation is an organism, and that it, uh, the more powerful nations will grow at the expense of the weaker nations. Now that, of course, fit Hitler's arguments that, uh, for his invasions of the weaker nations around Germany. And it also fit his idea that nations with similar cultural uh, affinities uh, have the natural right to be together. Now, Ratzel was the guy, he actually used the term Lebensraum, which of course became central to Hitler's uh, ideas. That is that this nation of Germany needed living space, Leb Lebensraum, you needed living room. And, and so all of that came together under German uh, geopolitics. And, of course, the fact that people were climatically determined was simply not acceptable. Now, it, that idea had been kicking around. Uh, Confucius was looking at how people in different climates and different regions had, had cultural and, and, and physical differences and so on. But post-war, this idea of climatic determinism was completely unacceptable. It's starting to creep back in now because, of course, they realized that, that there has to be truth to it. There has to be some basis to it. But, of course, the problem was that Hitler had used it to develop racism. And it was uh, he developed the idea that, of course, that people in hot, warm climates were lazy and stupid and indolent, and people in warm or in cold climates were vigorous and aggressive and intelligent. And so you've got Aryan superiority and the inferiority of the black people on the planet. And, of course, the Berlin uh, uh, Olympics were designed to, to uh, show that, and then Jesse Owens came along and blew that up in his face. But you really don't understand what was going on through these things unless you get into this literature, what the academics were saying, what was the thinking and the thought processes at the time. And Ratzel's work was enormously influential. Now, the same ideas, by the way, were being promoted in America at the same time. Uh, an American uh, geographer by the name of Ellsworth Huntington uh, was um, saying that, you know, 
he, he actually had a map of the world in which he showed that people from certain areas were intellectually superior to people born in other areas and and all of all of the problems with those kinds of, of, of things but anyway so you can see then that 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 from my doctoral thesis studying the Hudson Bay Company taking the mix of arts and science of, of geography and history and then the political realities of history um, I suddenly realized that yeah you can study history separately you can study geography separately you can study physics separately you can study biology separately but they really don't make any sense unless you understand how they interact with each other. And the most fundamental thing for me, because my interest in climate was how climate change impacted human history. That, that was really what, what I was interested in. Um, uh, then th that, that led me to uh, this, this idea that geography is the stage History is the play that's played out on those sta that stage, and I mentioned the Hudson Bay Company. The, why, why did what triggered the demand for furs in Europe? Well, the Hudson Bay Company got its charter in 1670. 1680 happened to be the coldest decade in the last thousand years. When when there was ice on the three feet of ice on the Thames River in 1683. And suddenly the demand for furs amongst the, the wealthy people uh, was there. And these guys are coming back from North America and say, oh, we got all these furs. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, the, the wealthy need those furs. And so the Hudson Bay Company uh, was created from that. And suddenly um, the, this interrelationship uh, started to make sense to me. And and now uh, that that's the overall theme. Now, of course, that led on to... Um, studying nation states, how they're formed, um, how they grow, how boundaries are drawn around the world. And of course, that led me into a, a whole lot of studies about animals and animal territoriality. And um, of course, it takes you into uh, uh, the social contract that the Russo talked about. And then Robert Ardrey's book of the same name, The Social Contract of How Animals um, um, where you've got dominant animal or group animals within a species that dominate the other animals, the alphas and the omegas, and then how they control territory and how you've got different animals with overlapping territories and how do they uh, you know, work together. And then how does that work on the human scale? And you go from um, you know, the, the idea that um, a, a, a cultural group were identified by the leader. So, for example, you have Attila the Hun. What do you say to people? Well, where, where did where did the Huns live? And people have no idea. But by the time you get to Elizabeth the First, you've got um, you know Elizabeth the First of England. She's now identified by the the dominion and land that she controlled, and th this is what you see uh, the, the changes going on. And, and, of course, conflicts uh, in the world today are along those boundaries. Uh, so that's a sort of general overview of, of geography and politics and, and geography and history and, and how I got there. Mm. Uh, it's such a fascinating uh, field of study because it raises so many important points. And perhaps we should take a moment just to underline and draw out a couple of those points. I mean, f first of all, what you talk about strikes me as the basis for technocracy in a way you have the 20 percent of students who are comfortable in science and math who are increasingly important in a world that is dominated by by engineering of one form or another which requires that science and math and then you have the 80 yep. percent of the the public who is not comfortable in such uh, in such manners of course that leads to the 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 idea the the ideology even that people should be governed by those few who can uh, do the math and and are uh, smart scientifically speaking but of course that ra gives rise not only to the actual technocratic movement of the 1930s the actual political movement yep. but also just that idea which I think persists to this day of that there should be this rule by this this elite who who can understand the math 
And when you combine that with the specialization, of course, you have the different competing fields of 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 the sciences uh, generally trying to compete with each other for who can control the direction that society will go in. And that's where I think you can see the development of the, 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 the real need uh, amongst some of these climate scientists to try to carve out their, their place at that table and to try to make themselves the most important pieces. This is the, the, the future of the world depends on what we are telling you, and we are the chosen few who can scry the tea leaves and discern hundreds of a degree difference in global temperatures. I mean, that's a, a fascinating way of connecting those, those different pieces of the puzzle together and explaining some of the psychology behind what's going on yeah well of course one of the ways you see that is that i my training and my doctorate is is, as as a climatologist that is i'm looking at patterns of of weather and how weather changes over time so climate change and and but and and this came up in 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 the lawsuits that were brought against me because uh, everybody talks about climate scientists they are not climatologists. They don't understand the patterns of weather and the mechanisms of weather. What cl- a climate scientist is somebody who has a specialized or is a, has a physics degree, but has specialized in the physics of climate. Uh, people don't realize that meteorology, for example, is the physics study of the physics of the atmosphere, um, and it's actually a subset of climatology. It, uh, but uh, well, but because meteorology came first, or at least people think it did, uh, they are the weather forecasters, and therefore they supersede the climatologists. But in fact, what's really important is is the climatology. But but a climate scientist, as I said, it could be a hydrologist, it could be a physicist, it could be anybody. And of course, what you see is. The arrogance of people that have the physics degree or the number crunchers, the computer modelers like Gavin Schmidt, like Michael Mann, who think that they, because they understand the numbers and the computer models, they're superior to everybody else. And, and that's, that's the problem. Now, one of the books uh, that, that related to this that had an enormous influence upon me uh, was a, a, a book a, a, uh, called um, Descartes' Error, because Descartes, of course, along with Newton, uh, these were um, people that were so uh, specialized in numbers and mathematics that they're on that boundary between um, being savants and being, you know, what could we say, normal people. They, they are people who have, who, who their brain is so um, concentrated and developed in one particular area, and and you see this. I mean, it, it, it that's the whole point about Amadeus, about Mozart. It, his his mind was so taken up with the music that his social skills, his ability to be human, was was dramatically uh, impaired. And and uh, so, uh, in in the book um, Descartes' Error, it's written by a neurosurgeon who, after doing brain surgery on many people, realized that there was a pattern going on. And what it was was that he noticed that if somebody's, um, if one half of their brain was damaged, um, then it affected their personality. And and uh, he... Um, um, he starts the book with the story about a highway engineer in the 19th century. And the most dangerous job was um, in um, putting the uh, dynamite down. Once they drilled the holes into the rock, putting the dynamite in and then, and then tamping it down prior to blasting it. And he was, uh, he, everybody loved the guy and he was so selfless that he would not allow anybody else to do that job. He had his own steel rod that he used to tamp it down. And um, he got distracted. He put the dynamite in. He forgot to put the wadding down in, and he put the steel rod down in, and, of course, it sparked and exploded the dynamite. The rod went right up through his eye socket, through the front of his skull, and out the top of his head. 
And he survived. And of course, this story is repeated. But what, what the neurosurgeon was interested in was this man went from a very, uh, everybody loved him. He was a great family man. He was very, very popular, selfless, very intelligent. He became a monster. He swore at everybody. They fired him. He hated everybody. His family left him. He just became totally inhuman. And this book, Descartes' Error, the neurosurgeon is writing about this where he's saying, look, I've noticed that if the pattern recognition half of your brain, that is these people who can do the numbers and crunch the numbers and recognize patterns, if that is damaged, then the abstract side of your brain allows you to continue to be human. But if your abstract side of your brain is damaged and only the pattern recognition part is left, you cannot function as a human being anymore. And this absolutely fascinated me, uh, partly because, of course, teaching the science credit for art students and then having them do labs and finding out the number of students that couldn't look through um, a stereo pair and see three dimension in aerial photographs and couldn't look at a topographic map and see how the um, isobars or isolines, the uh, uh, contour lines were actually creating a three dimensional figure. They couldn't see other than in two dimensions. And then the more I dug into that with Carl Sagan's book, Broke His Brain, and, and realized that humans are born two dimensional. We learn the third dimension. And when you look at human history, the concept of the third dimension only comes into human history initially with the Greek miracle. Okay? And uh, the Greek miracle is that around 700 BC to 300 BC, a 400 year period in there, um, the Greeks realized there was a third dimension to, to the planet. Now, if you, um, if you go to the Parthenon, it is a building that is so much this whole story of human evolution of the brain and perception and development that so few people understand. Yes, um, uh, da Vinci understood that it, it, the measure of man and all of that stuff. But very few people know that what makes that building so harmonious is that every measurement in it can be divided by the radius of the base of the columns in that building. That's the first thing, okay? So there's a built-in harmony. You see this in architecture, and I also studied this, brick buildings are essentially the, di the dimensions of a brick building are determined by the dimension of the brick or the half brick. That's why red brick Georgian buildings are so harmonious and pleasing to the human being. People don't know why, but that's what it's all about. Now, the other thing about the Parthenon is that the Greeks realized, the people that designed the Parthenon and the, the, that society realized, that our view of the world is distorted by the curvature of our eyes. So what they did was they realized if you built the base of the Parthenon absolutely level, if you stood at one end of it and looked along, it would look like it was dipping down in the center because of the curvature of the eye. So they deliberately built the center of the base about, I've forgotten what the dimensions are, but it's something like less than four inches, but it's slightly higher in the middle than at the ends, so that when you look along it, then it looks perfectly level. Now, you could argue that that is, it's really deceiving the eye, what the French call coup d'oeil, you know, the, the, the blow of the eye or deception of the eye. But they did the same thing with the, with the columns. If you stand at the base of the column and look up, because of the curvature of the eye, and if the column was just straight tapered, it would look like the curve, the column was curving inward. So they bulged it in the center to offset that, um, that uh, false uh, image that they wanted. So when you start to look at the Parthenon and its understanding about 
people's minds, how they see the world, the two-dimensional, the three-dimensional. When you go to the go to Egypt and you look at all of the Greek or Egyptian art, it's all two-dimensional art. The third dimension comes in briefly with that Greek miracle around that 400 BC, 700 to 400 BC, but it doesn't come back into the world until the Renaissance. Well, what does the word Renaissance mean? It means the rebirth. It's the rebirth of the Greek understanding of the third dimension. And what do you see with the, the baptistry in, in, um, in uh, Florence, uh, uh, with the... Um, the architecture of that time, and then you get um, um, uh, Canaletto with the vanishing point, the three-dimensional art of, of 15th and 16th century uh, Italy, and suddenly an awareness of depth and, and three, three dimension. But you also get it in music, because you go from two-dimensional basic uh, 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 Elizabethan music into harmony. Harmony is the third dimension of music. So suddenly, humans as a three-dimensional understanding animal is created. Now, studies have been done uh, that show that when you've got a child in a crib, if you've got uh, the, those things over the crib that the child is looking at, particularly if they're rotating and so on, those ch children develop three-dimensional depth perception skills better than ch children that don't. And therefore, they develop their, their brains differently in, 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 a, in, a, in our modern sense of it, more advanced than other children. And, and so you can see um, all of these things tie together in our understanding about the world. Now, the other, the, the other part about three dimension, of course, is that it's why uh, Copernicus was able to get across the idea that the earth was going around the sun and, and that the earth was a sphere, a sphere um, uh, the third dimension of, of astronomy and cosmology comes in at the same time. Now, what's interesting about that, of course, is that um, people today still think that the sun goes around the earth. In fact, 25% um, of the American public when they were asked, they said, yeah, the sun goes around the earth. So what Copernicus said over 500 years ago, to the average person, it doesn't matter. They don't care. If the sun goes up and goes down, what do I care which is going around which? And that, of course, you see, comes back to that disconnect with where science is and where the public are and how people can live in a world where there's such disparity between perception and understanding in science and so on. But for me, what's equally important to it is the, um, the idea that if we allow this small group of people of uh, what in the 30s they called logical positivists, that is people that believe that if you could, you, you could quantify everything, you could reduce everything to a number, that, by the way, is, of course, why the social sciences developed. Because if you went to a university library, like the Bodleian Library at Oxford in Darwin's day, uh, and, and it's still there today in this way, there were only three entrances. There was the entrance to the natural sciences, there was the entrance to the um, humanities, uh, and then there was the entrance to the library. But the largest library door today in the universities is social sciences. Well, think about that contradiction. What are the social sciences? It's a hybrid term, right? It's, it's not science. It's not social. But what you're trying to do is quantify humans and human behavior. And you see the introduction of statistics into psychology back in the 30s, where you're trying to quantify human behavior. And it worked reasonably well in sociology because you're, you're dealing in, in groups of people. But it didn't work when you started to get into um, individual behavior. And that was another thing that, that fascinated me, uh, James, with this whole idea about uh, geography and history. Because um, I was involved in a project in, in the Brandon, Manitoba, where they wanted to build uh, a housing estate for low-income people. 
And so they knew who was going to qualify to be living there, and they went and did a survey before they started building or designing the project. And they said to people, okay, what, what sort of things do you want to see in this, in this project? And the people listed all their things. And I said to them at the time, I said, look, I can, I can guarantee, I can predict to you what the outcome of the, of the, after the building's built and people move in and live there, I can guarantee I, what's gonna, they're going to say. And they said, oh, yeah, what are they going to say? They're going to say, it's all right, but. And, and, I, and I said, don't, don't even ask me how I know that. Just go and do it and do the survey after. Well, that's what they did. They built it. People moved in. Then they went and asked them, well, how do you like it? And every single person, it's okay, it's all right, but. Why? Because they got these lists of things that people wanted to see, and one person wanted whitewater canoeing, and you know, another one. And one. Well, they look at this and they say, well, we have to apply statistics to that, to this. We can't accommodate every everybody. So we go to everybody, we accommodate everybody that's within one at most two standard deviations of the average. So that means anything that's third and fourth standard deviation from the average is not going to get accommodated, yet everybody filled out a form in which they had one thing they wanted that was three and four standard deviations from the average. So there, it's okay or it's all right was satisfied, but their but wasn't satisfied. Mm. So the result was predictable. And, and of course, that, um, uh, you know, and I, I, my, my classic, uh, I'm so proud of this, brag about this, but I said, you know, McDonald's is absolutely uh, typifies this uh, modern world because what McDonald's have done is they have perfected mediocrity. Right, and the reason that people go to McDonald's is because it's mediocre. You're never going to have a fabulous hamburger. You're never going to have a lousy hamburger. It's predictable, and that's where people are comfortable. The people that are not comfortable with that will not go to to McDonald's, but that leaves McDonald's with the with the one standard deviation right. over 60% exactly. of the population yeah. that are going to go there. Well, I would make and, the argument so, they're all lousy yeah. hamburgers, but I get I get the point. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. It is yeah. it is certainly yeah. something that's very standardized and very predictable and uh, and does conform to the tastes of the majority of the population, which is why it has persisted as an institution. And I think what you're saying brings in so many different implications economically, politically, yep. psychologically that until we yep. start connecting these various fields, we don't have an accurate picture of why the institutions that are in place in our world today exist, why they persist, how they came to be, or how they can be changed. And I think what you're pointing towards is the idea that connecting some the, the two hemispheres and, and getting people to, to more uh, engage in a more conscious way with the ways that they construct reality uh, through those different ways of seeing the world, if we can get people to, to, to do that in a more conscious way and to, to develop, hopefully, the weaker side of their uh, whichever hemisphere might be uh, dominant or, or weak in that relationship, might be the way forward to constructing healthier institutions it, generally speaking, well, you, in our society, them, yeah, make make them citizens of Earth. Uh, but you see, it, it, just just for example, we've we've got conflict going on right now, and people, you know, they say, "Well, the Middle East." I said, well, "Where's that? Middle of where? East of what?" That's a colonial term. Why are you still using it? It has no application. You're talking about the Far East. You're in the Far East, but that's another colonial term. And and in Americans they say, well, where, where's Chicago? Oh, it, it, it it's uh, Midwest. <laughs> no, it isn't. It's mid mid east. But oh, you don't want to be called Middle East in Chicago. But you look at where Chicago is on the map. Why? Because in the American mind, the geographic mind, okay, the geographic map of America, the uh, the um, Appalachian Mountains down the east side divide Eastern America from Western America. And of course, when you do when you do it that way, then Chicago is Midwest, and and yet they use these terms. They never think about them, and it distorts their their the reality. And I'll give you another example. 
um, everybody's been in the, in the schools and they look at their map of the world and the political map up on the wall. And then you say to them, look, the only thing that's accurate about that map is right along the equator. The minute you move away from the equator, the map is increasingly distorted and wrong. And by the time you get to the pole, the distortion is so great that you've got the pole as a single point, and yet on the map it's got the same length as the equator. Hmm. I mean, how distorted can you get? Yeah. All right? So, so uh, th these are the things that um, why people simply uh, – well, they, they don't even try to grasp them. They just, they just uh, let it go. But it, what it does is it means that people that do understand these things, of course, can exploit them. And that's what these uh, megalomaniac leaders do. Yes. Um, I mean, well, one of the things that... Well, I, I hate to cut you off there, Dr. Ball, but I think yeah. we are coming towards the end of our time. We've been talking for over an hour okay. at this point. And, and oh, just okay. like the global uh, average temperature, there's so many different points that we can and should get into and hopefully will in a future sure. conversation. But before we leave things... Uh, for the listener today, you've mentioned a few books that were formative in, in helping you to understand some of these different perspectives. But is there anything that you've written, any articles or anything that you can direct people to from your own perspective about some of these issues? Well, uh, some of these ideas I put in, in my book on, on the deliberate corruption of climate science, because um, uh, I, the book needed a context. Uh, it People needed to understand. So I talk in there, for example, about von Humboldt, and I talk about Darwin, and 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 um, and you know how how science has become so dominant. Um, I talk about those things in the book, but I also have written quite a lot of articles on my website that uh, relate to these issues, and and so that that's probably the best place that you can can uh, start with, and and of course uh, the books that I've mentioned plus others. Uh, th that um, people would want to read. Uh, just just to give you an example, I mentioned Ellsworth Huntington, the American um, political geographer, and he wrote he wrote a, an article back in 1904 called "The Pulse of Asia," and it, it's a fascinating article that helps you understand today's world because he said the whole history of the world is centered around. Um, the interior basins of Asia, the Tarim Basin and the Zungarian Basin. And these are vast inland grasslands, and the populations there expand and contract with the rainfall pattern of 300-year rainfall pattern. And as the rain increases, the grasses increase, the number of horses increase, the number of people, and the people spread out. And they spread out, of course, into the surrounding areas. And one of the uh, uh, things to combat that was the Great Wall of China. It was for people coming from the interior Asia that was threatening China, which saw itself as the Middle Kingdom. And that what Huntington shows very effectively is that the expansion and collapse of these uh, uh, Mongol hordes, as they're generally referred to, uh, really dictate the pattern of history um, in, in Eurasia. And uh, so uh, those are the sorts of things that I, I, I make reference to in, in the articles, in the books, and so on. But uh, to me, it, it, you really don't understand history. You don't understand the modern world if, if you haven't got these larger images and understandings. Well, once again, this is a, such a fascinating conversation and it opens up so many different fields of exploration and combines so many different fields of exploration. So thank you for giving us a lot to chew on until we do speak again. But uh, once again, I will refer people to your website, drtimball.com, drtimball.com, where you they can find your articles. And of course, there on the front page, there is a link to your book, The Deliberate Corruption of Climate Science, available on Kindle and Amazon. So I hope people will check that out. And until we do speak again, Dr. Timball, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for the opportunity.